good evening, everybody. You're all very welcome to the May the 4th Sci-Fi Film Festival. So my name is Dave Byrne. I'm the Film Festival Director. I'm with uh, Gary O'Toole, who's from Blab of the Hood. And we've also here tonight with us, Michael Fitzgerald. He's the Director of Stormtroopers. You're very welcome, Michael and Gary. Hello again, gents. Hi, Dave. Hey, Gary. Great. Listen, Michael, it's great to have you along. Um, we go back a while now, Michael. Um, we've, we're, uh, we're big fans of your work. Uh, we were just chatting to ourselves behind the scenes there earlier, just to, you know, how you've grown as a filmmaker. So this this all started, uh, you know, about over six six years ago, Michael, would it be right, or maybe even a, a little further? Uh, okay, 2015, released 2016, seven years ago would have been seven. the prequel or the pilot episode which we filmed in a desert in a stormtrooper suit in 40 degree heat in the pinnacles in Western Australia and finished in the back of a tank in the Imperial or the military history war museum in Meath. Um, so that was the starting point. Um, the next step off from that was, I suppose that the first episode proper, which we filmed in Cork, Waterford and Tipperary. And I suppose we've just wrapped and premiered the the latest episode of, of Stormtroopers, and that's gone another couple of levels beyond again in production value and effort. Yeah, absolutely, Michael. You're right. So I mean, we we had screened uh, as a lot of people know. I'm involved with uh, underground cinema down in Delary, and uh, we screen we screened the uh, Stormtroopers at the festival down there. We also screened it at the monthly screenings that we have every year. Stormtroopers was nominated for a good few awards. If I remember rightly, Michael, you picked up a couple of awards that night as well. Yeah, it was best VFX and best sound, which was pretty cool because like I'm passionate about building my my team down here. I've got a good VFX team, so they got an award straight off the bat. That built their confidence for the next episode. And my sound guy as well got an award that night too. Um, and he came back on board for the next episode. So all those awards really helped kind of validate the effort and validate the team. And um, so if one of the team wins, then the whole team wins. Um, so they were they were big steps from, from us to be validated like that, which was pretty cool. Absolutely. What a team, Gary. An incredible team. And... Michal, if you could actually give, could you actually give people an idea of the size of the team presently? I mean, three was such a step up from two, and you know we've been lucky enough to to meet some of the the cast of characters who have been involved with setting it up, and you've obviously been very kind to us and given us looks behind the scenes. But to put a put a scale on it, how big a team does it take to put together Stormtroopers? Okay, well, I suppose I can give an example. Previously, the team was this small, but now the team we have right now is far, far away. So that's the production scale we're working off at the moment, um, to put it in dramatic context. Um, so we're pretty very lucky that we have an awesome VFX team in Dog Day Media. We've a, a cast that we've had since day one, which we've looked after, which came back to us for the next episode. And we've grown that with new um, acting talent that we've met on set and on different projects. Um, we've had an upgrade on our, our makeup people and our props people. Um, uh, we've done 3D printed projects to 3D print a battle droid. And um, we've built this set, which you can see behind me, which is like gives us full 360 surround uh, immersive opportunity um so yeah from the the physical sets to the people the team is grown and along with the locations as well so i suppose for me the locations would be just as important as casting the actor so with this latest episode now right you know we've cast locations into the team such as Countingham Lock or uh, Port Road Dive Quarry or the Maritime College in Cork 
um, which we actually returned to after the last episode. So uh, we, but we've tried really hard to grow the team in people, um, facilities, resources, and obviously ambition. So, so, so we're, we're trying really, really hard. Gary and I were very lucky to get a sneak preview of the film down in Mitchellstown Cave. Uh, Michael, um, I, 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 I was down in the cave uh, that night and I had a quick word with Gary just before it started to say, you know, the game has gone, the, the, the bar has been raised to a huge, huge level. Uh, you've really pulled it out of the bag. Uh, this time, Michael, the production values were superb. I was hugely entertained by it. Well, that's cool. I suppose at the end of the day, the story has to be entertaining. Like I think film has to be about bums on seats or eyes on screen. So, so no matter how ambitious or how much work we put into it, it has to gel together and it has to present as a story. I suppose we're looking at things from another point of view as from the Stormtroopers universe, like what if, you know, we see things from another angle. Um, so yeah, so, so the opportunity there, we think there is a huge opportunity for another angle of storytelling. And again, that night, Mitchstown Cave was pretty special because we filmed the last episode there. We premiered the last episode there. So to get the opportunity to go there again, just demonstrates that, you know, we're really, you know, growing a, a repetitive, consistent team that kind of can hit the marks again and go bigger. So um that's what that's what kind of what I'm really passionate about right at the, at the moment is is the team, the consistency, and the accountability to do better. So Gary and I were chatting about this a little bit earlier before before you came on, Michael. And you, what you've done, you don't really see it that often with a fan film. The storyline that you've the, your script for this particular one, and Gary said it to me earlier on. You're touching on post traumatic stress disorder, Gary. You maybe want to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, I think in terms of fan films, uh, particularly maybe in the Star Wars universe, it's always the Jedi, it's always the hero, it's always good guy. But there's very few that really focus on the boots on the ground in, from the perspective of the, the troopers, the groundhogs who are there, effectively putting their lights on the line and who are seen as expendable pawns in the Imperial machine. So what was it like putting together a script, uh, Michael, where effectively you're looking at something which has a, a pretty dark tonality to it? Yeah, um, I suppose the script is inspired by, I suppose, people I've worked with in, in my own life, in my own career, in engineering jobs and the construction site. And, you know, you're always, you know, on the tools trying to get through the, a body of work to a deadline to get your wage check at the end of the week. So I suppose I kind of come from that universe of, you know, grunts in the trenches, but obviously from a construction point of view. Um, I think from the Stormtroopers universe, I just thought it would be very interesting to see, you know, what if these were real people? Like, it, like we all love Stormtroopers in battle scenes, but like what if they're each one of that falls, they have a family behind them or herself? Uh, what if they have, you know, their own personality, which connects with us as an audience as as a reflection of our of ourselves you know so i, I it, it would be hard to believe that every one of those stormtroopers is not either there through some conscription point of view or through there to provide for their family because there is no resources on their planet or you know has a genuine ambition that they join up to to you know either believe in the propaganda or or otherwise to make a difference in their in, in their planet community and universe so these are all qualities and i suppose characteristics you see in our own country our own county our own continent so i suppose all i was trying to do is maybe just humanize the stormtroopers and just hopefully encourage the audience to ask a question of what if you know what if there's another point of view what if we saw things from that poor stormtrooper who was something blasted off the death star or you know being um, airlocked into space so uh, what if they have a family behind them you know so so seeing that humanity from another point of view i just thought would be very very interesting and the story then develops from there very easily because uh, i suppose with most stories if you can have interesting characters that connect to the audience then that makes the whole process a lot a lot, lot easier you know 
Yeah, and I think you can empathise with characters like that when you can find out a little bit more about their background and they're a little bit more human rather than, you know, you know, your stereotypical stormtrooper that shoots or gets shot and drops to the ground. That there's a story behind these. And you think you I think you you would have seen it, Gary, you think you would agree and you know, The Force Awakens where it was sort of the first time where we actually saw a stormtrooper with a conscience, you know. Um so I think once once we saw that in, in The Force Awakens, it opens it up to huge possibilities, you know, where you can develop storylines for a lot of, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be a stormtrooper, it could be any sort of bad guy or good guy. You just open up the story a little bit, a little bit more. And I think you, I think you, I think you nailed it. I think you empathize with the character, uh, characters um, in, in the, uh, in, in the short. And it's, it's a 20 minute short. I would have, I could have even sat there for another, you know, another hour w watching it because the concept is, is uh, it's, a, it's a really, to me, it was a bit like a pilot. Uh, you know, there, there, there definitely could be, you know, a really good, cool feature, a fan made feature film there, you know. What are your thoughts on that, Michael, a feature? Yeah, absolutely. I suppose we can see each episode is getting more ambitious. Um, I even think, though, I suppose Rogue One would be, have definitely been a major influence that you see you saw characters who were already part of that empire army who almost you know became more knowledgeable of the bigger picture but up to that point they were still part of that imperial army universe so who's to say that there's not more of those characters out there in a outer rim district doing the job of keeping law and order in the universe but uh who's to say that it's not until a certain point that I suppose that the, the true nature of the Empire universe reveals itself or not, if we're looking at things from another point of view, you know? Yeah, um, you, look, you look at guys our age, uh, Michael, you know, uh, you know, um, like Empire is always my my favorite out of all all the star all the Star Wars films, you know. And it, it depends on what generation or how old you are. I suppose I was there from the very start, so uh, Empire will be number one for me, and the reason why it is is because I, I just love the way it just turned dark. There was no happy ending to to the Empire Strikes Back. You know, it, it was quite a, a departure from the first film. So when I saw, I was at the premiere of Rogue One with the five oh first. I I I thought, wow, this is absolutely incredible. You know, they've uh, it's it to, for me. I thought it was up, you know it was up at that sort of em Empire level. And I think it opened up uh, opened up a huge gateway of you know for for uh, you know for these type of dark storylines. And if you watch Andor as well, Andor is quite a dark dark one as well. I think dark works really well with with, with Star Wars. You know, um, we've all got a dark side to us. You know, but yeah. well, I think dark has to have a backup. It can't just be dark. If it's dark and it delivers like Andor has, it's worth it. You know, we saw K nine. Yeah getting gunned down a rogue one you're like oh my god they're not getting out of this it really just the whole film turned on that point and you, you felt like the jerky does and he went actually this is turning the whole thing on its head there's not this you know uh, so that was i thought that was a huge culture shift and looking things from another point of view that the heroes are not going to get away uh, but again i think going back as you said to empire that was the first film i think in in many where the ending was not a happy ending and it was completely open-ended and the audience was going, I need to find out what happens next. Uh, and that's a huge, hugely brilliant position to be in. Like if the, if the yeah. audience is in, is in the game with you, has got skin in the game with you, that's the win. If they want more, that's the win, you know? And on top of that, Michael, Back then, I mean, that you, you can churn out a, a Star Wars film, you know, in a couple of, you know, in less than a year. But back in those days, it was a three-year wait, you know, to find out exactly what had happened. And I can remember as a, you know, as a young kid, speculating for three years, you know, what happened to Han Solo. And it was probably one of the best best pieces of marketing for Star Wars ever. Is is you've got that th three-year wait to find out exactly what what had ha what had happened. Um, um, it, it, it will remain with me, and, and I can remember it so well going to see um, Return of the Jedi. I just couldn't wait outside the Ambassador Cinema in Dublin. Big, massive, big queues, wow. queues to get in there. It was very, yeah, and it is a very powerful memory. That's the thing about Star Wars as well. 
it's a it's a it's a generational thing. My father brought me to see Star Wars. I started bringing my son to see see Star Wars. I might have no doubt the way it's going out at the moment. My son could be bringing my grandchildren to Star Wars. That's how long this is going. We're close to fifty years now. But the, but that's the definition of legends and epic when it's relayed through generations. You know, um, and I'm doing, I'm doing the same with my nephews and nieces as well as you know. And say bringing them to the premieres and then seeing all the interest and seeing that their imagination too can be put on screen and just people interested in stories like, like I think the the power of the narrative across all industries and politics and commerce, the narrative especially with podcasts and you know and the like is could be more and more uh, profound and the power of it is 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 being realised you know. This is a passion project for you, Michael. Um, how long have you been working on, um, you know, the last the last stormtroopers? Well, look, I suppose COVID hit everybody. So yeah. when we started this episode, there was no Mandalorian, Book of Boba Fett, and or, or um, so that's how long we've been going. And I've loved seeing the Mandalorian uh, develop. I've loved and or. I think it's been absolutely fantastic. And we've had to keep our powder dry through the whole thing, knowing that we have ours coming as well. But it was just, it was kind of, it was, we'd love to have got ours one out, ours out earlier. But look, you know, as I said, COVID got in the way of everyone's timeline. Um, and I'm quite proud that we got started before COVID. I'm quite proud we never gave up. I'm quite, quite proud when we resumed filming, we did all the right things. I'm quite proud when we finished it, we took our time. To finish, finish it with VFX and color grading, uh, and sound effects, and even we've used the screenings to tweak the balances um, at each point as well. So look, I suppose there's, there's a maturity there to go. Look, we'd love to have got out, got it out earlier, but look, there's also kind of a satisfaction going. Look, at all stages, we've been doing our best and continually patient to do the right thing. Um, so look, I'm really, really excited about showing. This film at Bay Fort Festival um, in Port McGee on Thursday. I think that festival is going to be absolutely brilliant. I think the the summer weather is opening up this week. I think there's a real hunger for a, a summer in Ireland, and I think there's a real enthusiasm around Valencia Island and Port McGee this weekend coming. Uh, I think it's going to be a really fun event to be part of, and uh, I'm, we are really looking forward to kind of obviously showing our film in that festival for our first time in a festival um, and hopefully the audience will buy into the story as much as we bought into staying patient and, and delivering it to, uh, to, to, to your audience. Well, thanks very much for the very kind words, Michael. We can't wait to actually screen it again. I was chatting to Gary before you came on saying I'm dying to watch it again on the big screen down in, in, in Port McGee. And you know what? You're you're right, right about the word patience. So let me just explain about COVID and um, a lot of people know I'm involved in filmmaking for the past 14 years. So um, we we at Underground Cinema and O'Leary um, have been, we, we screen roughly around 150 short films a year. Uh, we have a very big award ceremony at the end of that particular season. So when COVID hit in 2020, March 2020, um, Nobody really knew what it was, to be honest with you, because we were hearing the news, uh, it'll be all over by April 20th. I remember that date very well, because that's my birthday. And I remember saying, and it was my 50th, and I can remember saying, at least I'll be able to get out and have a 50th birthday two years down the road, and we're just getting, getting over it. But what it did do, Michael, is we saw an awful lot of filmmakers that had been either in pre-production or in post-production, po in particular, post the guys that were in post they were able to, because a lot of film festivals had sort of had to shut down or went, or went virtual, which we, we ended up doing, it meant that an awful, filmmaker, an awful lot of filmmakers did the right thing and took their time. So a filmmaker has a, sometimes a filmmaker has a tendency to rush a film to try and get it, get it through to, say, a prestigious film festival like the Galway Flower, the Dublin International Film Festival, or the South by Southwest Film Festival in Austin, in, in Texas. You're racing. When you're raised, you can drop the ball. And you can, as a, as a festival director, I would watch an awful lot of films and I could see the continuity is wrong here. The, the grade is incorrect. They've, there are a lot of uh, schoolboy errors here in that race to get that film to the film festival. But by taking your time, and that's what happened during the pandemic, everybody had nothing but time in their hands 
they were able to work really well in post-production, get the edit right, get the sound right, get the grade right. And lo and behold, they had an incredible, an incredible film at the end of it. So that's what we're seeing at the moment. So any films that were made around 2020, 2021 or 20, you know, that sort of time period, the production values have gone through the roof. And that's trying me trying to put a positive from a negative, from a, a, a yeah. pandemic that we never thought we'd ever be in, ever. Um, um, we're seeing some incredible work and we're seeing some incredible scripts. And that's why Gary and I were just talking about your script. Is that I haven't seen that sort of approach with a fan film before delving into that sort of uh, subject matter. It was really interesting that you did it. Thanks. Well, first of all, happy birthday 10 days ago. <laughs> well done. Second of all, I'd say you're probably not a day over 32. But I am <laughs> lying because you're the chairman of this conversation. Um, but three, we actually did have the script written before COVID. But one thing we did do was pre -vis a lot. So before we went to film something, me and the dog day boys, um, we would have maybe pre VFX stuff. We would have gone in, maybe done a, a test film, brought it away. Uh, and done a small bit of matting, uh, a compositing, just to see how it worked out um, before we went filming, for example, post-COVID then, maybe we had more attention on our shot list and our angles, knowing that we had restrictive practices because of the controls that are in place afterwards. Um, we also, you know, tried very hard to think through uh, once we were going to locations who were kind enough to let us back in through that nervous period after COVID that we had a plan, we had a thought through. And look, look, we were very lucky as well. Look, we we had some top name actors come back to us like Carolyn Bracken, a new actor, Pius McGrath, um, Case, Clancy Casey Williams came back to us. Um, so they all gave, Peter Cosgrove gave back to us. Um, so they all came back to us with really, really strong credentials. Um, and then we were able to dot up and comers around them. So we tried hard to use that time to not only just, uh, I suppose, uh, get our post-production right, but during it to get our previous rights going up. But if we get to film again, this is what we'll do. And, and don't get me wrong, there's still a huge effort at the end of the day in a filming day. But we did try hard to go, well, look, what can we pre-prepare to get right? Like, for example, are the Battle Droid, Boots, ET5. Um, he was made because we had the time to make a droid. You know, I needed a character in the Marauder. We had time, so I got one 3D printed. I got this really cool Italian guy to do up the painting, and then I spent two months gluing it together. Um, so that was an example of maybe using adversity, and Boots was created because we had that time to go, okay, we have time to make a 3D battle droid full scale, which turned out to be brilliant from filming because all the lights and angles bounced off of naturally, you know? So that was very, very cool. So that's, that's, what, that's why we tried hard to use, I suppose, that time to pre and get things yes. right. And then obviously post-production then, you know, that was, that, that's a different kettle of fish. Um, but yeah, so look, I think COVID was hard for everybody. As you said, I think, I, I love the game going up. I love seeing the tide float up all boats. Like if, if the quality is going up all around and we all have to pull up our bootstraps and, and match match the competition, you know, and, and that's that's beautiful. That's that's the way it should be, you know. You have a fantastic look. All your cast and crew are fantastic. Uh, you you have a fantastic actress. There is uh, Carolyn Bracken. Now let me tell you about Carolyn. Carolyn was actually nominated for a Best Actress Award at Underground Cinema last year for a fantastic short film she did called Cleaner. And that particular film, which which was a two hander, uh, a really really nice uh, piece piece of filmmaking. And in that particular one, <laughs> she was blonde. She was a, a blonde hair girl, and then um, it was only when I was when I was looking at the film over and over again, and then I looked through the credits and said, "Geez, that's Carolyn Bracken with dark dark hair." But she did a great job, uh, Michael. Really good. Now well, Carolyn's really gone gangbusters, and I'm delighted for her. the way I see it. If one person in the cast or crew goes up the scale, we all go up in their coattails, and that's that's the joy of it. I think Carolyn has been just finished uh, shooting a, a co-production between RT and New Zealand right. on a series called The Gone. Um, that was finished up just before 
the end of last year. I think it's in post production at the moment, and I think that'll be in RT in the autumn. So I, I think Carolyn's talent is going to really reach a, a broader audience and what you saw in the cleaner and we have seen in other previous parts for work and what yeah. you say Gary and ourselves saw in the last Stormtroopers where we completely underused her but seeing her talent on set it was obvious what she had it was obvious so that's why her role in the latest episode is more significant because we literally just opened our eyes and just saw the talented people we had on set from actresses to VFX through, you know, uh, a builder's pair of hands. And we, so that that script, for example, expanded because of Carolyn's talent, which is pretty cool. Like, you know, it's, that's, that's the dream. You, you find a piece of talent or resource and your project, you know, develops uh, integrated with, with their potential. So, so that, so that, that to me was a big, big win, big win. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, Michael. You're also uh, one of your team, uh, William uh, William Bean, has been nominated for visual effects. Gary, talk us through some of the visual effects that we see in this film. Well, I was lucky enough to get a sneak peek at some of them before the film was actually, ble- and I believe Michal, you showed me a couple of things while things were progressing along. So that was amazing. Um, I think the the big one are, are we all right to say it or are we going to yeah. be given spoilers? Yeah. So for, for me, the there's a, the the tie scene is one of them, the one that you did show me in tunnel just because in five and four I am a tie, so that for me was just incredible. <laughs> but one that myself and Dave had already discussed was the Corvette. For for me, that was just that was the icing on the cake. I can't even imagine the level of detail and planning and fine tuning that went in to to get that right. So, what was that process like for you guys from start to finish? Well, look, that ship was actually meant to be in the last episode, but we couldn't fit it on the beach on the location we filmed on. The previous, like I was at home and Christmas before we started that filming, trying to fit 3D models into some scout photography I did. But the, the, the ambition was always there to use that ship. I think that Corvette class is a common class of ship in that universe. I, it was originally meant to be the Millennium Falcon, um, but then it got changed to a new design, I think, late in the day in the original Star Wars film. Yeah. So that's why you saw the quality of the opening ship was because it had hero-level effort up until a point that hero-level effort got redirected onto a new design. So I, I just think it had huge potential. And I suppose the challenge for us then was to basically, look, how can we make this demonstrate the... The, I suppose the capabilities of this ship in flight, in battle, and how do we show an internal of it? Like that ship was meant to be legendary in the universe from a adaptability and from a, a convertibility point of view. So that's why you know you see kind of almost familiarity in the outside, but on the inside you can see it, it's much much darker. You know, um, I don't know if you've actually looked at the film in more detail, but not to spoil the film, there's a big chase with that Corvette in the film. And that footage is actually from Star Wars Canyon in Nevada. It's nice. actually called the, the Jedi, I think it's the Jedi Run. So that's where the US Air Force tests a lot of planes. So uh, that was our little nod that there's real world applications and inspirations in Star Wars universe of play. And we were to we were able to borrow some of that location to to, to fuel and build our uh, real universe where our our our, our, say our hero ship um, goes into battle. Your cinematography is incredible as well, Michael. I mean, you can all, when you do when people do watch this film, Janet Carey, it's almost like an, an ad for tourism in Ireland because the the uh, locations are absolutely stunning. Um, and it shot so well. Um, your your cinematographer did a brilliant job. You must have been really pleased with that. Yeah, we had a, a good team. Now, obviously, Billy Cummings would have done the bulk yeah. of the retro photography, but we had an awesome uh, drawing guy called Michael McCarthy. We also had an awesome drawing guy called Peter Grogan, who I never met, and on the strength of an email, took his wife up Kongshing on Lock in December 2019 and shot drone footage of Kong Shingong Lock 
which actually ended up in the film. It was so good. Um, we also, you know, Count Shingon Lock, for people who are not familiar, is, I describe it as a volcano in County Warford. It's actually a quarry, but it, it looks like a flooded volcano. And it would just, it has that whole specter, you know, presence of, a, of, a, of geology. And so just with a few little extra VFX touch-ups, I hope we we're able to bring out the potential of that location as the, as the big bad um, in any sort of uh, story or narrative, you know. Uh, we also had the use of the National Space Centre in Cork, which is actually a real live space station, which is only about five miles from where I live. Um, and that gave us the big, large array, which we were able to do our filming on structure. So I suppose I've always tried very hard to find locations that uh, are cast like an actor and if you put enough effort and pre-visualization into them, they become the cheapest visual effects we'll ever do. Um, so between Billy Cummings, Michael McCarthy, Peter Grogan, uh, we got we got we had a fantastic team of who we needed to get the shots and you know dropping drone shots was like you know which children do we want to kill unfortunately but we couldn't have them all um, you should see the stuff we left behind it, it would make a great really great tour city yeah. fantastic yeah um, you were uh, some of the five oh first uh, are involved in the film so some of the stormtroopers that you see in the film are members of the five hundred and first Ireland garrison so for those that are, are not familiar with the five oh first they're a costuming club in Ireland they're they're they have a legion that's right the way across the world. The costumes are screen accurate costumes, and the guys take great pride in making these costumes. So uh, they were they were heavily involved for the past couple of years, Michael, um, with stormtroopers. Yeah, look, I suppose I don't want to name anyone too specifically because the five hundred first group has been amazing. But the likes of Don Shane Murphy and George Banbridge. Uh, a Bracebridge, excuse me, and uh, Tudor Davies, Todd Lambert, for example, like they've done repeat days and repeat days and repeat days for me. Uh, and then I've obviously tried to include as many of the 501st as I can um, on our filming days because, in essence, you know, they've, they've been carrying the can for the last 10 years plus of the Star Wars interest um, in Ireland and around the world. And like these guys come with their own amazing costumes, like so. It's just like the locations, like we were able to find people who shared the passion. They're hugely professional on set, and they could the the the, the quality of their of, of their own wardrobe. It can't be competed with. And I think in, in episodes, early episodes in Mandalorian and subsequently in Andor, I think they they learned that trick that there was actually already costumes out there. You just had to involve the fan base and it was a win-win for everybody. So so I, it was quite cool to see that kind of, that trick repeated, say, in, in, the, in, the, in, the real, in the real Star Wars universe world. Yeah, and it was one of those stormtroopers that was down in Mitchellstown Cave. Um, Tudor, Tudor Davis was down in the cave that, that particular night and he, he watched it um, he, he watched it afterwards. And both Tudor and I uh, picked up on one thing afterwards and we almost nearly said it at the same time. The score for the film by Brian Lane was incredible. The tension it brought, it brought a, a great level of tension right the way through. It was very subtle, very subtle. But it's right the way through the film, and it did. It did. It's. It it's like. It's like a. It's like another actor. It's an important. It's an integral part of that film. That score. We look. We know Gary and Blabber the Hutt are major score fans, so we had to put a bit of effort in to make sure we had to know, you know, Blabber the Hutt and Gary on board with interest, because uh, I know like they they do a lot of work when reviewing scores and promoting you know releases and the like and supporting live performances. So like. Like, believe it or not, we do actually pay attention to what the, the likes of Blab and the Hutt and Gary do and what people are interested in. So it was obviously that, and we've done that with all the episodes, that the, the sound is 50% of the film. So, like, you can have an amazing film and without the sound effects and without the score, you're not delivering the full potential. And to be honest, the score is actually, it's like a band-aid to all those shots you put together. The score will put the glass on it. It will put the integration on it, it would put the emotion on it. 
Uh, Brian Lane is actually a local composer who's based in Manchester now, and his work is starting to come into prominence at the BBC. So just like Carolyn Starr is rising now with the upcoming series of The Gone and RTE, Brian Lane is getting commissioned for BBC Three, BBC Four uh, dramas over in Manchester, which is cool to see. So when his star rises, like we'll be on his coast tales too. Um, even the likes of George Bracebridge, you know, um, Ireland's favourite granddad in the Denny's ad, you know, seeing his star rise, like he's been putting in hundreds of auditions, like over the last uh, half dozen years, like so. Seeing his star rise and being in our film, that's pretty cool too, like you know. So look, it's I suppose again, um, it's just trying to box level. What can we do? to make this film awesome. Even the, the grading, for example, was done by Cheat in London, who also uh, graded An Irish Goodbye, which won an Oscar. So now like, so just by making that investment in people and making that investment in quality, the universe is already giving us the payback in our people um, winning success in their own field. But like, it just validates the choices we make to, to be lucky to have them on our project, you know? And so, but I think, just, you know, the five yeah. one. But I think what you're saying as well, though, Michal, and I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm sure Dave will agree with me. It says an awful lot about you in particular and the team you have set up. Because as Dave mentioned, this is, I suppose, a little bit of a, it's almost like free advertising for Ireland because it is a an Irish Star Wars film in Ireland for Ireland. But as you've mentioned, this was going on during a pandemic, and as Dave very rightly mentioned, the places where you had previously filmed and been in contact with and worked with, they let you back again despite only coming out of what had been a very, very uncertain time in terms of, a, I suppose, a business and prosperity perspective. So I think that says an awful lot about the hard work and dedication that you've put in, but also that you've surrounded yourself with an incredibly good team in that it seemed to, it would put everyone's mind at ease to bring you all in again. So I don't think you can get any higher price than that, in that they let you back into their space post-pandemic. Absolutely, and that's the trick. Is like you know, the, the, the secret of getting back into the door of a place is to hopefully leave it in exactly the same pristine condition as you got it. Whether it's like you know, making sure Mitch Stone Cave when we left filming the last episode, there wasn't a scrap you wouldn't have known we were there. In Camden Fort, when we filmed this, I spent half a day doing the wash up, but that was and my brother was sweeping out. The, the the underground um, uh, magazine storage hall, which we used for our own filming, but look, we are proud that they let us back in. We're proud that look, we'll 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 do our best to leave the place as good as, if not better than we left it, as a compliment and as a thank you. And then look, it's lovely to go back to people again, going, look, remember that last project we had? It turned out great. Would you like to do another one? Um, so I I think they appreciate that too. That. No one's getting forgotten. No one's getting left behind. And where we do have the opportunity to bring everybody with us, um, that's what we're going to do. Um, and like, and why wouldn't you do your best to, uh, I suppose, to uh, look after people who work with you? Because guess what? We need a, a new sound effects person or a new makeup person or, or a new, uh, I suppose, you know, DOP or VFX guy. Guess what? You looked after the last ones you had. So when you they'll answer the phone. It's much easier to look after good people and good places than to start from scratch and go out and find them again. And I, I think that's that, that's a, philo a strong philosophy we, we'd like to stay consistent with. That works very well in all walks of business, Michael, and can be applied to any walk of life. Surround yourself with good people, look after them, and you will always be, uh, you, you know, it'll always work really well for you. I'm going to just the, ask... The, Sorry, I, I I think the dream for me is that, that maybe at some stage I could take more of a step back, um, obviously you know with bigger budget, bigger projects, and these people's full potential will be realized realized because they're all a hundred percent autonomous as well, like you know, so it'd be less more, it'd be less me all driving the van and more about right these guys have time, space, scope, and a budget, and wait to see what they're gonna do because we know what they've done already. That that's the dream. Fantastic. I'm gonna ask you one one last question. It was one it was one thing that blew me away when I when I watched the film and I said, oh, no one's thought of this. Scuba trooper. You invented the scuba trooper. 
Well, actually, I, I can't take 100% credit for it. I saw it in a comic about Did you? 30, 30 years ago. No way. Um, yeah. Um, and look, I've got a scuba diving license, and I just wanted to connect all the locations together, and I think we found a fun way to connect them in a consistent way that it stayed you know, true to the script and the story. And, you know, my favorite show growing up was The Fall Guy. I always wanted to be Lee Majors. I think at the age of four, I tried to change my name to Cold Seavers. So, like, you know, so the opportunity to be a stuntman in my own film was just too good to resist. And I am a qualified advanced scuba diver. Um, we did all our recon diving beforehand. And we, yes, we did fit him with a stormtrooper suit underwater, which we tailored to be as close to the scuba uh, trooper look as possible. And also true to the situation that that scuba trooper was coming from, not to spoil the film. Um, and obviously, you know, those bubbles you see underwater are my bubbles. And yes, I did make it back alive. I'm still here. We we actually had a little bit of a chat about that, didn't we? Uh, because it was actually going to be one of my costumes that I was considering doing, Dave. But the CRL and getting the armor parts for it are actually very very tricky. I think I I think I sent you one of the the reference library costumes, Michal, didn't I? And I sent you some Absolutely. of the the early yep. pre-work that was done on the, the fins because there was a debate about whether the, the jetpack had expen uh, extendable wings or whether they were they were solid. But um, it, it was incredible to, to see it. Even after the film, I was like, I'm going to thump him because he actually <laughs> got no, to do it. But, but, but in fairness, I suppose, between ourselves and between you know the wider community of the film, like I, I do try to be as open as possible to collaborate. I, I don't try to be selfish and keep all the toys to myself. Where I have an opportunity to go to a, a so a, a trusted or resource or not like like Gary or David the Hutt or to the five or first, I do where I can evolve someone from five or first with maybe a different costume. I'll change the script. You know, I think the key is to work with what you have, um, and obviously then the VFX helps as well. That you know you might not have everything, but the VFX is good enough now that they know we'll give them ninety nine percent of it, and if we need a one percent. We'll get it. And that's a learning too that that's kind of this whole episode has taught us that like, you know, we can actually go a step again. Uh, and all that previous stuff is very similar to the previous you'd see in the Star Wars behind the making graphic novels you'll see or encyclopedias. We're reading them and going, We're doing exactly the same thing. We're on the right path, you know. they these things just don't happen. They're obviously being taught and taught through. So so yeah, just being able to borrow on, on on the community like is a big win. You know, it's a big win. You're going to see you, you're down with us for most of the weekend, uh, Michael. Um, we start on May the fourth. We're going to be premiering uh, pre uh, premiering your film uh, in the community centre in Port McGee on May the fourth. Uh, we have two other great films on uh, direct directly afterwards. You'll be with us over the weekend, also. Yeah. Uh, the 501st Rebel Legion and Real Icons will be down at the festival with close to 40 different costumes to to um, maybe you can keep an eye on them. It could be written into the new feature film, Miho. That's exactly it. You've got my secret. You've now got my whole business plan, which is taking advantage of people who already <laughs> exist. <laughs> Michael, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you tonight, as always. We really look forward to seeing you at the festival. Congratulations on all the nominations this year. Gary, as always, it's a pleasure bringing you along to have a chat with us. And, no, thank, um, you. thank you both for having me. We look forward to seeing you both at the festival this year. Cheers, Dave. Thanks, Gary. See you, guys. Take care. May the 4th be with you. See you Thursday. Hey!